Hello everybody, welcome to Talk About Houses. I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Uh, we are gonna do a market update for Las Vegas. Yes. Uh, for the real estate market today. And this is for the month of March for 2022. Uh, we have all the new data, we get it about every month. It's the same data we get. We do this every single month. So um, subscribe, hit the notification bell so that every month you can get updated as to what's going on. In Las Vegas real estate market, we're tracking the leading indicators. Mm -hmm. These are the things that tell you ahead of time what's going on in the market. Right. And not hype. It's nothing's, we don't have any hype here. It's all data we're going to show you. And it's not our data. It's data from a, a third party. Yeah. Al, Altos <laughs> Research, they're actually, they, they're bringing the data down. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and put up the first slide here. This is the market action index. Now this basically tells how hot it is. Uh, where you want to see that needle is over there uh, around 30 or 40. That's like a normal market. It's a skewed thing. It, it's usually a seller's market more than a buyer's market. That's why uh, that it's uh, that far over. But you could, last month it was 65, it's 71 today. Right. Just in a month. Right. I mean, it's it's really amazing to me how sellers have decided that they're staying put, not putting their homes on the market. So the few homes that are on the market are being chased by a lot of buyers. Um, to kind of give you perspective, I had an agent call me today who did not put in an offer on one of my properties, but wants to make an offer on for her client on another property in the same subdivision as my listing. And so uh, she is asking listing agents and buyer's agents that are under contract in that community, what did it take to get an accepted offer? Uh, and so it's really very remarkable the lengths to which buyer's agents are having to go to to figure out a way to get the winning offer for their clients. Uh, I have agents who, whose clients are out of town and they will fly in at a moment's notice to look at a house and put an offer in on it. Uh, of course, we've been doing offers sight unseen for a long time. It is really just, I think, unprecedented the lengths to which buyers are having to go to to secure a property, as well as buyer's agents. Uh, it's a lot of work on the part of the listing agent to having to sort through so many offers and, and help everybody uh, understand what's happening. Yeah, it's a super hot market. Um, we're gonna go to the next slide now. Median list price. Now this isn't as, it, it is an indicator, mm -hmm. and it is a forward-looking indicator, because when you see this going down, the market's usually already tanking. Mm -hmm. uh, the Both the seven and 30 or 90 day average are up. Uh, according to this, it's about over 550. Now remember, it's a median, so it means half or above, half or below. This number can change as if lower, if, if more lower price homes come on the market versus higher price homes come on the market. But you can see the trend basically for the last year. If you look back there, it goes March 2021. Everything beyond March 21, 21 to the left is totally normal. Very slightly increased, slightly increased. Uh, the last year has been pretty phenomenal. It has. It's been really unprecedented. Yeah. Um, as Juan had mentioned, list price is not a, the greatest gauge because, mm -hmm. you know, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. How home comes on the market, almost nothing sells for list price. No. So what's happening is homes sell above list price. Buyers are either waiving the appraisal or putting a cap on how much they will pay uh, the, the difference between appraised value and purchase price. Uh, buyers are getting creative and they're paying traditional seller closing costs. So like all of them. <laughs> So, for example, in, the, in, in Las Vegas, uh, a traditional seller closing cost is uh, the uh, transfer tax, right? Which for us is $5.10 for every $1,000. And I've seen buyers say, we'll pay that. Uh, a traditional seller closing cost in Las Vegas is the, uh, the common interest community um, transfer fee, their, any sort of capital contribution, anything like that. That tends to be a seller cost buyers are saying we'll pay for that uh, the special improvement districts these are not inexpensive they're 10 11 twelve thousand dollars or more buyers are saying we'll pay for that yep. so again so you, you're looking at an offer that let's say for the sake of argument might be five hundred thousand on its face value but by the time the, the buyer is paying for all these seller costs you know you could be looking at an offer that's really in value maybe 515 or 520 sure uh, and remember, all these extra costs that the buyer is paying for, it can't be rolled into the loan. It's going to have to be uh, money brought to the table at closing. So this is really important to, to understand because it gives you an idea that 
these buyers are not cash poor. So they're not just purchasing homes at the top of their range and have nothing left. Uh, they clearly have enough cash to put down a down payment, pay for their own closing costs, pay for the difference between appraised value and purchase price, pay for the seller's closing costs. That's a lot of cash to come in with. Okay, the next slide we're gonna put up here is median days on market. Now this is median. The reason why we don't use average is because it's highly skewed to people who have homes on the market in either really high price ranges has been on the market for like a year and it skews the thing. So median, half the homes have been on the market this amount of time, half the homes have been on less amount of time. The seven day average, if you look at it, is at 20 and declining. So now you see the waves, how it goes up and down. Those up, though, a lot of those up, some of those ups are just normal variances throughout the year. But if you look at the trend of this, it's not getting better. It's getting shorter time on the market. Right, uh, so uh, to yeah. that point, so when you see that the time on the market is let's say 20 days, that's not really a good indicator for you because let me give you an example. If you have multiple offers on a property, it might take you five or more days to negotiate all that out and get to a, a final accepted offer. Now that whole time, the property's still on the market. Yep. So was it really, did it really take you know 20 days to sell that property? My argument is that no, it didn't because maybe I spent five, seven days on negotiating offers. So maybe the, the real time on the market is substantially less. So kind of keep that in mind. Everything we have listed in the last couple months, mm -hmm. I think within a day or two, we've had offers. Since last fall. Okay, yeah. everything's getting offers super quick. And yeah. it, so it says one or two days on the market. If, it, if, if you see the MLS four days, that means it sold the day. It just, that, that's how long it took paperwork to go back and forth. Right. Okay, next thing we're gonna look at is price per square foot. The nice thing about this is, it, in a way it's better than median prices because it, it, it's, it's the value across all homes, mm -hmm. right? This, if you look back on the left side of this, it's very slightly increasing, very normal, and then it po it's going up. What's really interesting is the seven day average is really screaming up. I mean, it's over 250 a square foot. This is higher than it was back in 2005, meaning remember the last time we had a run up and then it crashed through. Um, it's looking like that, meaning the front of this cycle looks like the last cycle, but there's the big difference here is we don't have people buying five investment houses at one time, hoping to flip them and make money and getting loans based on not having enough income. Right. That's really the difference. So there's a lot of support uh, in this market in Las Vegas as far as home values because probably um, maybe close to a third of them out there might be free and clear because between the institutional investors who obviously those properties are free and clear and the mom and pops who have uh, lots of equity and those homes are either free and clear or have substantial equity. There's so much support uh, that way that even if there's a decline in values, we're not gonna have see what we saw before because you're not gonna have this rush to market uh, for all these properties. And like I said, and, and like Todd said, lending practices have changed. We don't have people who are buying multiple properties. We don't have people who are over leveraged, meaning doing 125% loans or something like that. Everybody has equity. I mean, even if you close on your house today, you have equity because between your down payment and <laughs> how much the market has run up uh, while you've been in escrow, you have equity. Um, from 2008 till 2012, 50% of all homes purchased were cash, mm -hmm. half. And a lot of those people still own the homes. Right. Uh, many of them, of course, are investors who bought. Mm -hmm. They have no reason to sell. They don't have anywhere else really to put their money. Mm -hmm. um, so like Juan has said, the base is different than it was before. Mm -hmm. Previously, the last time this happened, there were so many people did not have equity mm -hmm. in their home. And the problem with that was that you know, when people had to sell, they had to drop the price and do short sales and that's what caused this. That trigger doesn't exist. It's like putting kindling on a fire, you know, to start a fire, it's not there. Now, we are, we are gonna show the next slide, mm -hmm. which is the most important slide. Mm -hmm. This is the slide that is the number one forward-looking indicator of the market falling, crashing, or doing whatever. Okay, but before we do that, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, 
and like the video. Yes. All right, do, boss man. Do all of those. Okay, here we go. The next slide, <laughs> inventory. Uh, the, if you look at this, it's self-explanatory. The inventory is just, oh, now these are homes, residential homes, barely over, like about 1,200. It's just over 1,000. That's the seven-day average. I think it was 1,277 or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's un, We have 400,000 residential units in Las Vegas, and most markets have that. You have about one house for every five people um, because people live in apartments and they, you know, families and stuff, a bunch of people in the house. So th this is like super low. This is ridiculously low. This number, if you look at this chart, it's only formatted the way it is because of what's been going on the last couple of years. This has to get well above seven, like this has to get probably above 12 to 15,000 before the market starts falling at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time we had a collapse in the market, there were 26,000 homes in of all types, homes, townhomes, condos on the market. So even up to 7,000, this is still kind of a normal market. It's just not, it won't be as hot. It may just go sideways a bit. Um, but we're, we'll, we watch this every month. Like this is literally the first thing we look at. If we see this number starting to go up and go up, that's when it's we start to get worried. Right. Okay. So inventory's low, guys. That's the bottom line. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the fun one we like to show. This is the market segments. This takes the real estate market, breaks it into quarters in Las Vegas. Uh, if you're from other states, like if you're from like Florida, coastal Florida or California, these numbers probably look pretty low. If you're from Tulsa, they look really high. If you've lived in Vegas a long time, they look really high. Uh, so the if you look at these, these are the median prices in the quarter. So top quarter, second quarter, third quarter, bottom quarter of the home values, not of the year, but of, val of all the homes. The thing you'll notice is the bottom two, the third and fourth quarter, the bottom half of homes, days on the market 14. Mm -hmm. Because we just have more people that can afford to buy in that range, more investors, all the flippers are buying in there, well, the other reason is because rent prices have gone up uh, so much that by that people are saying, well, maybe I should just buy because then I at least I can control my budget that way and my mortgage payment will stay the same as opposed to my rent going up every year, you know, 15, 20 percent, whatever it is. You know, rents across Las Vegas have gone up more than 20 percent in the last year. Um, if you look at the very top one, it says 1.45 million. Remember, that's the middle of the top quarter. The median. So, to give you perspective, in 2009, 310,000 represented the 10%. Only 10% of all homes in 2009 sold above 310. Mm -hmm. And now we have about 12.5% selling over 1.45 million. You can't just look at prices. That's what I keep seeing these videos where people market crash and people comment on the, vi on the video. Market, well, it's going to crash because prices, prices can't do that. Well, I agree they can't do that. And we should see some other things. The problem, what's weird is we're not seeing them. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing the, the what's coming next. We don't see it yet. Um, do I agree prices are probably higher than, than they should be? Yes. Would I like to see them like stabilize and hang out for a couple years and go back to normal market with seven, 8,000 houses on the market? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, this no nobody likes this. This is but you know what we're doing is we're just trying to give you the information that we're seeing when we look at numbers because we have anecdotal information because we're practicing real estate. We're talking to clients. We're talking to the like Juan has said the buyer agent calls and wants to find out because they're trying to figure out how to get a house for their client. And then we also have investors we work with. We're trying to give them good information like hey should I sell now like and we're just like well we can't tell you yes or no because if we say yes of course the market will double. And if we say no, don't, then you know it'll it'll be bad. So we don't give that advice. We just try to say, hey, look, here's the data. We don't know, you know, this is what could happen. This is what could happen. But um, until I see really inventory changing substantially, um, and then other external factors, really uh, well, something bad. Uh, there'd have to be a black swan event in Las Vegas, I think. Something weird would have to happen here. Well, and the thing is that what's happening in Las Vegas is not unique. I think it's happening across the country. You know, you're seeing the same thing in lots of different um, cities, even cities that are not uh, benefiting from a mass influx of um, transplants from other places. They're, they're going through similar uh, pains as far as uh, not enough sellers and more buyers chasing properties. We still have record low interest rates. Uh, we have people who, let's face it, for the past two years uh, haven't gotten out of their pajamas 
have had nowhere to spend money, so they've been maybe earning money because they, they could work remotely, and they have been just accumulating money. So th there is money there to support this market. Yeah, and remember, keep in mind that like Austin, Texas, Miami, Nashville, mm -hmm. Las Vegas, a little bit with Phoenix, uh, Boise, and even Colorado, mm -hmm. have been the recipients of the change in demographics mm -hmm. that have rapidly happened over the last two years because of all the stuff that was COVID related, state government related, and other things that have been happening um, with the tech industry and with the, the change of people working in offices to working at home. They're going to these other markets. Companies have left markets because of prices and well, the other that's thing, driving it too. The other thing, Todd, is that a lot of companies that before said, you know, you have to have your cute little smiling face, you know, at a desk in, in our in our building have now discovered that maybe they don't need to have your cute smiling face at a desk in their building. And so they've got a lot more remote workers. These remote workers are choosing to relocate maybe closer to family and in markets that you wouldn't consider maybe, uh, maybe some small towns. So long as they've got a good internet connection, uh, you know, they can still do their jobs. And these companies are saying that maybe this is a, a good, good fiscal move for them too, because uh, they're, they're making their footprint, uh, as far as their office footprint, smaller. They're cutting their costs. Their employees are happier because they're, they're maybe someplace that, that they would rather be. Uh, maybe that impacts the amount that they spend on labor because now maybe their employees are living someplace where the cost of living is, is lower, so maybe they don't have to pay quite as much. So there are a lot of dynamics at play that, that are, are making all these, all these changes. But I kind of keep going back to the one thing, which is that uh, sellers, by and large, are staying put. So long as they're, they're staying put, properties are not churning. And when properties are not churning, that means that buyers are chasing properties uh, beca because there just aren't enough of them on the market for them to choose. Uh, something potentially that is a 10 to 20 year down the road thing is the baby boomers are getting older. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, older. They're basically 57, 58 and older. Those are the baby boomers. And a, um, a lot of them will reach the end of their life and a house will come available. Right. So what's interesting about the baby boomers is that previous generations, uh, as they retired, they went ahead and downsized. So these big homes would come on the market, right? And then the baby boomers, again, would turn <laughs> like properties. Like in neighborhoods. Right. So then these, these baby boomers would sell the big house and go buy a smaller house. So that means that there are properties coming on the market and properties being sold and, and this is good. What's happened is over the last 20 years, we've kind of gone back to the situation where uh, families are living together more, meaning uh, you've got multi-generational homes. And you're seeing that in the big, bigger homes where you've got multi-generations living in there, you're seeing the builders get this because builders are building multi-generational homes, so brand new construction built with multi-generational in mind. So you're seeing that. So I think that's gonna be interesting to see because as these baby boomers age out, as Todd said, and they go and retire to the great real estate wherever it is, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, what happens to those homes? Because they've got multi multi generations living in those homes, will those homes come on the market, or will they simply get inherited by the other generations that are living there? So that'll be an interesting thing because this is different than anything we've experienced in the past. We have been making market update videos, I think, since two thousand eight, but at least since two thousand nine. Mm -hmm. So thirteen, fourteen years. If you want to have fun, we've got almost eight hundred videos. You can go down to the very some of our very first market update videos that we did, there probably was just me for quite a while. I did a lot of just videos by myself. Um, and you can see you know, the, the, the updates we were giving back then as to what was going on. And of course, that was during the, the crash when things were really bad. Um, if you're trying to buy a house in the near term, the, the, the long term things aren't going to affect you. Right. There's just going to, you know, either you're just going to have to figure out a way to buy a house or you're going to have to move to a market where it's more affordable or you're just going to have to rent and, and deal with it. Um, there has been, of course, we did this video about how war in the Ukraine mm -hmm. would affect the housing market. And our summary was that it believed it would not. And 
I mean, it d didn't negatively affect the stock market. Stock market was up about two percent. <laughs> Dow was up two percent today, so it's not necessarily going to crash the market. And I know there's videos out there that say crash, crash, crash. But if you go to those channels, they, about every two weeks they do a the real estate market's going to crash. They have a ton of subscribers, but they get all their subscribers out of fear and. They don't have any facts. They just say, all they do is point at the price and go, this can't keep doing this, but they don't have anything to back it up. And they've been saying this now for two years. They said as soon as COVID happened, the real estate market would crash and it's opposites happen. So um, like I said, we'll look at this every month. We're gonna be objective as much as possible. And um, what else? If you like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, like the video and uh, leave us your comments. We wanna know what's happening in your market. We know what's happening here, and we broadly know what's happening across the country. But real estate is hyper-local, so we wanna know what's happening where you are. If you think the market's overbought and you want to sell your house, our contact information is in the comments. Reach mm -hmm. out to us, and we will sell your Las Vegas house for you. If you are anywhere in the country, you can still reach out to us. We have this great uh, platform called Referral Cloud. It's something that allows us access to top agents all over the country. We can find you an agent in your market that would be really good at selling your house. Absolutely. See you on the next video. Bye. Bye.